Welcome back to The Lincoln Project. I'm your host, Bree Galen. Today, I'm coming to you all solo to give you my thoughts, as we're recording this, on last night's Republican presidential primary debate. The debate, which aired on Fox News, consisted of eight candidates seeking the GOP nomination for 2024. Ron DeSantis, Vivek Ramaswamy, Mike Pence, Nikki Haley, Tim Scott, Chris Christie, Asa Hutchison, and Doug Burgum. Donald Trump, the presumptive nominee, did not participate in the debate and instead gave a pre-taped interview with Tucker Carlson that was posted on Twitter or X or whatever we're going to call it nowadays, five minutes before the debate began. There's a lot here, so let me just say this, that I think it is the height of 2023 in the American Republican Party that all of these candidates had to sign a pledge to participate and support a man who would not sign a pledge and would not participate. I think that basically tells you all you need to know. And so, you know, guys, here's the thing. None of it mattered. It doesn't matter what any of the media says about the horse race or how Donald Trump is still who Donald Trump is, that Ron DeSantis is still lacking humanity, that Mike Pence has the charisma of a bowl of vanilla ice cream, that Vivek Ramaswamy is... Trump Jr. None of this matters, right? Oh, but Nikki Haley had a good night. Okay, in the context of the unreality in which we're living, sure, she did. Chris Christie got some great shots in on Vivek Ramaswamy. Who cares? Neither one of them are going to be nominee of the Republican Party. When asked whether or not they'd support Donald Trump if he's convicted of the 91 different counts um, of which he's currently accused, six of the eight said they'd support him. Tells you all you need to know. Chris Christie sort of did a half hand raise thing. I'm not sure whether or not he thought he was trying to pull a fast one or what. At least Asa Hutchinson just kept his hands in his pockets. But here's the thing, guys. It's all, as George Conway said to me last night, rearranging the deck chairs. The party that I grew up in, the Republican Party that I grew up in, that my dad worked in, that so many of my friends and colleagues worked in, that some of them still work in, is gone. We've said this a million times. It's gone. It's not coming back. What this is, is the long-term metastasis of something that started with Abraham Lincoln, Ulysses Grant, Teddy Roosevelt, Dwight Eisenhower, Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Bush, and has now come to this, has come to this, which is a grievance party that has no desire whatsoever to speak in the terms of how Americans are actually doing, but to further divide, to further extol how bad a place America is. America is a country in decline. This dystopian vision that every one of these candidates in their own way shared with the American people last night is something that, like, you should take them seriously. And, you know, the idea here, too, is... Let's be clear that like Young Americans for Freedom, which is run by a guy named Scott Walker, another failed presidential candidate from Wisconsin, governor, former governor of Wisconsin, and Fox News were the hosts of this debate. So you should not be surprised when they're like, we have a crisis in X. We have a crisis in Y. Why do they have to say that? Because they have to say it to give these people any hope whatsoever of being elected dog catcher next year. The Republican Party doesn't have a governing philosophy. It is a nihilistic, anarchic political organization based in an authoritarian movement led by a guy who has no business whatsoever walking around as a free man or being a qualified president of the United States or candidate for president of the United States, excuse me, either under the laws of this country or under the constitution of this country, 14th Amendment, Article 3. He participated, like every Confederate in the Civil War, in an attempt to overthrow the government. He is guilty of sedition. And yet here we are pretending somehow that this was a debate. This wasn't a debate. This was eight people getting up there to show that maybe they're qualified for 2028. Maybe they're the next Donald Trump. Maybe they could be his vice president or his chief of staff or his commerce secretary. It's all bullshit, and pardon my French, none of it's real. And the only thing that keeps it real is that somehow the idea that so many of us, too many of us, whether or not that's people like me that spend all day every day on this, 
our friends in the media, our friends in the elite of Washington and New York, somehow pretended that anything last night that happened mattered. It didn't. None of it mattered. How could it have mattered? The one man who's going to win the nomination didn't participate. You know why? Because he knew he didn't have to. What was he doing? He was on Twitter with Tucker Carlson, right? So now you have one man who was thrown out of office by the people and is now facing prosecution for refusing to abide by the will of the people, and another man who was fired by Fox News for costing them nearly a billion dollars for pushing conspiracy theories. And that's considered normal. That's not normal. They, they keep talking about neither one of them like, oh, no, we're not conspiracy theorists. And then they have an entire conversation about who killed Jeffrey Epstein and who's really behind it. Right. I was listening to a podcast, the New Yorker podcast uh, this morning, and they had John Meacham on as a host. And Meacham, who is so brilliant in so many ways, he speaks in poetry, he writes in poetry, said something that it used to be that political campaigns and political candidates were difference of degrees. This is a difference of type, right? Joe Biden, whether you agree with his policy or not, is a normal American president. He is a normal Democrat. He is someone who gets up every day and says, what am I supposed to do on behalf of the country and the people I serve? Donald Trump and his Republican Party are not differences of degrees. They are differences of type. They are none of the things I just described as Joe Biden. They are none of the things that previous Republican presidents, whether you agreed with them or not, whether they did the right thing or not. And I'm the last person to say that it, they did everything right because they certainly didn't. I believe that they got up in the morning and said, what am I going to do on behalf of the American people? Donald Trump and all these people on the way down. They have a very narrow band of people who they must kowtow to. These are the MAGA. These are the people who will make or break the Republican Party in 2024. I was listening to Steve Bannon's podcast yesterday. Why? Because maybe I don't like myself that much. But the point was, is that Bannon had a pollster on that said he, his data shows that if Donald Trump isn't the nominee, 28 million Republicans will stay home. That means that Joe Biden probably wins 40 states. OK with me. But you know who it won't be OK with? Not Donald Trump. He, he will take his ball and he will go home. It won't be OK with, quote unquote, establishment Republicans and the Republican donor class, because here's what they know. This is the deal they've made with the devil. If Donald Trump isn't the Republican nominee, then all of their candidates in the U.S. Senate are now certainly in danger of losing because they can't win without his voters. All of their candidates in the U.S. House, where they will attempt to expand a majority, will lose because they can't win without Trump's voters. So sooner than later, right, you're going to see the Republican establishment, and, you, and I'm putting this in air quotes for those on video, is going to get behind Trump because they know they might win with him. They can't win without him. They don't care really if he wins or loses, but they can't not have him on the ballot next year because they know it's the end of the party. But if they were smart and if they cared about American democracy and they cared about the country and they cared about your kids and mine, they would take this opportunity to say, we don't want Donald Trump and we know it's going to cost us maybe two or four or six or eight or 10 years in the wilderness. But you know what? There's a chance if we disavow this guy. There's a chance if we say, vote for your local Republican, do not pull a ballot for Donald Trump. But they won't do that, right? Because they're all based in self-interest. They have been since he walked across the stage in 2016, since he took office in 2017. They have since. They knew that they should have said him attempting to perpetrate a coup on the American people was wrong from the moment of election night 2020. And now Ron DeSantis and all these other candidates, they, want to, they say, we shouldn't go to the past. We should talk about the future. We have to stop talking about 2020. And, and January 6th, because that just helps Democrats. No, bullshit. We talk about January 6th because, like the Civil War, like the firing on Fort Sumter, it was a pivotal moment in American political history. Which way are we going to go? Republicans last night showed you which way they're willing to go. 
I don't care if they criticized Donald Trump for spending too much money. I don't care if they said that Mike Pence did the wrong thing. I don't care what any of them say. Six of the eight of them raised their hands and said they will support Donald Trump if he's the nominee. They all know it's wrong, and they're all going to do it anyway. And you know what? That's the story of the Republican Party and so many of its quote-unquote elites. They all know it's wrong. They've all known it's wrong since this idiot came down the escalator, and they've done it anyway. And they have brought us here. Now, we have a responsibility as well to make sure that it goes no further, to make sure that in 2024, we ensure that Donald Trump doesn't just lose, but that he loses badly, that other Trumpy candidates lose badly. Why? Because whether or not it's court cases or bad PR or the hopes and dreams of other Republicans that just want Trump to exit the stage, he's not going to. He's not going to until he and his beliefs and his actions and those like him, whether or not it's Ramaswamy or DeSantis or any of them, are shoved off the political stage by the American people and their voters. And that's our mission, guys. That is our mission at the Lincoln Project and everybody in the American pro-democracy movement. We must understand what it is we're up against. These people, they don't have rules. There's not a line they won't cross. There's not a word they won't say. There's not a thing they won't do. When you see them say something that you can't believe, believe them. Believe them. As Ruth Bingyat, who's brilliant on this, says, listen to the words they say. They make you the promises they want to keep. Why would we want any of these people, any of them, to have responsibility for you, for me, or for 330 million Americans, or the other billions of people who even to this day still look back towards America as a beacon of hope and freedom and liberty and opportunity, right? And so it's our choice now, guys. Ron DeSantis called it a time for choosing because that was something they shoved into his head in debate prep, but he doesn't know what it means and he doesn't care. But it is. The choice is ours, gang. The choice is ours. And it has been ours and it will be ours. And so the choice is this. Are we going to go towards the path of darkness and Trump and MAGA and all of the ugliness? Or are we going to choose the path that will be harder for all of us in the short term of light, of democracy, of hope, of, as Dr. King said, bending the arc of history toward justice, toward helping Joe Biden get reelected? You know where I stand. And I think I know where you stand. And now is the time for all of us to stand up together and to lock arms and to say, we don't have to agree on everything, but we agree on one thing, that this group of people that we saw last night and their leader, Donald Trump, and he is their leader, must never again hold a position of power or public trust in this country. Because if and when they do, it is the end. The experiment has come to an end. It is blown up in our faces and the damage that will come will be beyond recognition. Now, guys, that's pretty dark. But again, the light is the harder path. It's the uphill climb. It's the one that will take all of us. But it's the one that's worth it. I cannot imagine a place I would rather be and a fight I would rather be in, in this time, than the fight we're in together right now. And I can only say thank you for all of the work that you have done, that you are doing, and that you will do in the coming days, weeks, and months. I want to thank you all again for all of your support of The Lincoln Project. As always, you can find me on social media, at Reed Galen on Twitter and TikTok, at Reed underscore Galen underscore LP on threads and um, Instagram. Everybody out there, this was the beginning, the beginning of the end of Trumpism. And together, we will make sure that next November, it finds its end for good. Thanks, everybody, and I'll see you next time. Thanks again to everyone for listening. Be sure to follow and subscribe to The Lincoln Project on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, or however you listen. Don't forget to leave a five-star review. To connect with us, follow us on Twitter, at Project Lincoln, and for more information on our movement, to join our mailing list, subscribe to our newsletter, or make a contribution to our efforts, visit lincolnproject.us. If you want to message the podcast directly, please send an email to podcast at lincolnproject.us. 
And if you want to personally join the fight to save our nation's democracy, visit jointheunion.us. For The Lincoln Project, I'm Reed Galen. I'll see you on the next episode.